Um, good morning. Thank you, uh, Mamad, for this kind invitation. It's uh, truly an honor to be part of this uh, convivial of uh, experts. So I, I'll try to bring it down to the uh, more mundane, uh, surgical, simple mind uh, of the blue-collar worker in the OR that I am. Um, there are some basic uh, terminology, but the most important thing has already been touched upon by Professor O'Grady and by Kim when we think about uh, uh, flow and resistance and pressure and interaction within the liver. So those are the, really the, the main things we have to keep in mind when we talk about flows within the liver. But most important is that the liver is a very interesting organ, as we all know, that's why we're here. And there is a, this uh, in concept of the liver capacitance. The liver can accommodate a lot of volume, and that's a very unique organ under that point of view. And also the concept of liver compliance, which has a lot to do with flows and pressure uh, at the time of reperfusion in a small graph. Um, there is some basic science behind this, uh, how flow interacts with uh, regeneration. And we know it's probably the number one trigger for regeneration after we transplant this small graft. And uh, we know that the rapid regeneration is associated with uh, some very good portal flow. Um, the, um, back in the days, um, Dr. Kleinman and uh, uh, one anesthetologist at Baylor did this uh, study directly measuring, so those are direct measures of portal flow in the upper room. There is no, there is no, th those were not ultrasound measuring. And uh, they came up with these numbers. Interestingly enough, these numbers, especially the number related to the, the one in the yellow, related to the 100 gram per tissue uh, of portal flow, is the one that then was uh, re-proposed uh, a uh, few years later when we look into what kind of flow can be accommodated by a, a living donor graph. But this is a very interesting study because it's a basic study of uh, portal flow in the OR. And uh, whether we believe or not that portal flow has an impact on uh, the function and then the outcomes of this liver, the reality is that there is more than one publication where it's clear that portal flow is directly related to the outcome of our patient, we need to have a very good portal flow to maintain a good outcome and function. Now, there are things of which more or less we all agree. Those are, of course, the uh, portal venous gradient and uh, the portal pressure. More or less, we all uh, speak about the same numbers. There are things that we accept, meaning that when we think about operating our patients or we talk about ourselves in these meetings, we kind of accept that there is a threshold for portal pressure that we shouldn't be go over. There is a threshold for portal vein blow, uh, flow where we shouldn't go over. There is a ratio, this mythical 0.8 that came up somewhere, and there is also a threshold of standard liver volume that we need to respect. Those are kind of accepted, I put them in parentheses, they are now set in stones. The science behind this number is not as strong as the science into the normal portal pressure and the, and the gradients. Now, what happens is a beautiful article. If, if, you, if you read it, it's a very good article regarding what happens after reperfusion. Clearly, uh, before reperfusion, as we heard from Professor Grid, there is a, a disease field uh, through which the blood has to go through. Once we transplant, all of a sudden we have a normalization of the resistance because the uh, liver is healthy and uh, uh, nonetheless, the uh, portal hypertension, it's maintained. It doesn't really go down to normal right away. It takes months in some patient and then go back to normal. And uh, of course, the portal flow is maintained for the same reason of the relationship between portal pressure uh, flow that I described before. Now, is that the same in living donor liver transplant? Well, yeah, it's the same. Practically, the, the, system, the same mechanics of physics that apply to reperfusion in the whole liver apply in a, a, a partial liver. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that it's now as immediate and has a much greater repercussion on outcome than it would on a whole cadaveric transplant. And those are some of the publications where you can see where uh, the portal vein flow per 100 grams of tissue in the donor is what was already recorded by Kleinman and Paulson back in 1990. And then the reperfusion instead is practically the double of what it was recorded at that time. 
we said that the liver has this capacitance and compliance. And this is interesting because, uh, as you can see, uh, the liver can accommodate an incredible amount of portal flow. And so, clearly, this makes you believe that you can probably toss a lot of flow into the liver and the liver will do fine. But there is, a, of course, a limit. And one of the few um, uh, things I think it's important to remember, back in 1996, remember this is before the era of living donor liver transplant became what it is today, Jean Imond already, when he was still at UCLA, um, the University of California, San Francisco, uh, pointed out that this small graft didn't do as good as other graft. There was a graft size factor that we needed to uh, include. At that time he spoke about a 50% of standard liver volume. And uh, he pointed out how flow may be one of the phenomena that were implicated in uh, the poor outcome of this uh, um, liver. And uh, we are much less in intelligent. Uh, this is when I was in, uh, in Germany with uh, uh, Professor Broche and Max Malago. This is one of our beautiful outcomes. Um, so there is a holy gray there. there. Uh, the holy gray is, uh, is there in our mind an optim optimal portal flow, an optimal pressure? Is there a, a, a perfect balance that can be found with a perfect size graph for that specific portal portal pressure? Reality is that it should be there because both hypoperfusion and hyperperfusion don't do any good to these uh, um, uh, segmental livers of the living donors. So there was already evidence back in the 90s that uh, you need a certain amount of portal flow to um, be able to have good results in living donor liver transplantation. Uh, that, in this publication, for example, they put a limit about 10 millimeters uh, uh, per minute per uh, kilo body weight. But you can go even uh, fast forward and think about that as we listened to the first talk, you cannot ignore there is a, a disease field. It's not only the liver that's diseased, there is a disease field around the liver, and the portocystinic shunts do play a major role in this uh, uh, scenario. Uh, Toru Ikegami, who just had a question before, published this paper. Uh, it was not, of course, the first one to understand this concept, but this is interesting in this paper where you see that by eliminating the portocystinic shunts, you do obtain an amelioration of liver function and eventually also a, a better outcome for your patient. And in our small ward in, in Dallas, what we did, we had this patient with a very large um, coronary viruses and we clamped them. As you can see, you have an immediate increase in portal flow. Just to demonstrate just visually how important and how much flow can go away from the liver in situations like this. Uh, Hyperperfusion is not good either. There are plenty of animal studies, one was mentioned before, where you do a very large hepatectomy and then you maintain high portal vein pressures and the result is that all those animals die. That was done in, uh, in pig, it was done in, um, in dogs with boil oil. And uh, this is a, 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 instead a, a human study where you can see that according to the difference in uh, the ratio between the graph size and the standard liver volume, the persistence, of course there is a drop in portal pressure, but in those small graphs, the portal pressure persists at a higher level for a longer time. So not only right immediately after the perfusion, but even a little later after the perfusion. And there is uh, some evidence from a macroscopic level that this causes damages at the sinusoidal level, they may have an impact then in the overall uh, function of the liver. Um, portal vein pressure, of course, does have an effect, uh, we all know that, uh, based on uh, how high it can be. Now, I said that we all think about 15 millimeters of mercury may be one of the limits. In reality, I don't think anybody knows because there are other factors. You cannot just extrapolate this for one single variable i.e. a port of impression, but clearly when it's that high, you do have an impact on your uh, function. As you can see in this paper, you have an impact of a port of impression of 20 on the overall uh, survival of these patients. And when you start to modulate, then all of a sudden you do have an improvement in survival. So those are evidence of the importance of the portal pressure, but also the fact 
that there's got to be a balance that needs to be found between how big is the graph and how much portal pressure you want to allow. We just heard that there is an impact of this because smaller graphs seem to regenerate a little faster. Now, those are very few patients. Interesting enough, all of these patients had really a, a volume that we would not describe to the reader, really like a very small for size volume. But reality is that the smaller graphs seem to regenerate uh, faster. And uh, Interestingly also, the portal vein pressure that was very high prior to transplantation and remained high after transplantation didn't have an impact on uh, the small graft in assuring the regeneration. So uh, the only important issue to remember, even in this study, the ratio is not that low. Um, this is a study from uh, Juan Carlos. Uh, the, the thing that is imp interesting about this study is if you look at the first graph, you notice how much volume can be accommodated by small graph after a period. That's the donor portal flow and that's the recipient portal flow. And even in this study, he noticed that smaller graph had a very uh, had a faster rate of regeneration. And as we mentioned before, this is despite the fact that the smaller graph do have also a very, uh, according to a very good portal flow, a very nice recovery of immediate function as we measure today by looking at the transaminases and the INR. Uh, this study though also had almost all patients with a very good ratio of about 0.8 in uh, graph ratio. Again, finding the balance very important because Again, those are things that we don't understand completely. When you have a smaller side, when you look down the line, this is a, a later regeneration. So six months later, the smaller graph regenerated a less amount than the bigger graph. So there must be something that needs to need yet to be understood. And this is also in relationship with the portal flow and the portal vein. Uh, now, as Somebody that's done probably uh, the largest number of living donors to date in the, in the world, uh, Sanjali uh, has thought this over, I think, pretty well. Uh, and clearly, he's always been one of the first that was a big proponent of maintaining a good portal flow to the graft to allow the regeneration and good outcome in the patient, especially in a time where everybody else was mainly focused on a hyperperfusion and he was instead thinking that maintaining a good flow was really a, a, a good point, but in balance with a good outflow and a, a good amount of volume for the patients. And we can go back to, again, jean Mond in his paper pointed out that because the clinical outcome depends on both the available parenchyma and factors that may vary between uh, recipient. So we cannot just uh, think about this as uh, single variables. So there is a, a very strong, and in my opinion, many things that we still don't know about the interconnection between flow, uh, recovery of flow after transplantation, and the size of the graft. So I think we are learning a lot of stuff. Uh, I think that make mistake is human. This is a very famous phrase in Latin. The errare humano maestro means just simply that it's human to make mistake. Uh, on the left side is the way we did the first living donor in, in Germany, where we were doing an end-to-end -end anastomosis between the right stump of the hepatic vein on the cava and the uh, right um, hepatic vein on the graft, and uh, uh, not taking in consideration at all what the portal flow would have been afterwards, and uh, that was the result. So I think we, we did learn something, and if we hadn't, then, of course, uh, we will be in the situation of a perseverare autum diabolicum, which means that if you make mistakes, you perseverate your mistakes, then you are doing something extremely evil. Uh, I don't have, a, a, being this a class, a solution to these problems. Uh, I do believe uh, that uh, balance is the key. Uh, I'm not a firm uh, uh, believer in very small graph. I let them do to the people who have more guts than I have. I'm a believer that a good graft size is needed. Uh, an excellent outflow is needed. The larger, the better. I believe, for example, that the right lobe is easier to modulate the outflow in a right lobe than in a left lobe. 
Um, and uh, I think that probably uh, the Porto Quevarchans that have been advocated are now uh, the, the best solution to these problems. Uh, it seems to be an artifact more than a natural thing to do. But of course, uh, I'm now here to teach something that uh, I don't believe on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.